my own training is as a comparative politics, comparative political scientist. So uh, what I'm always very fascinated by is how just when we feel that we understand how China works, things change and create new puzzles for us to try to figure out. So, uh, you know, I've been studying China for a very, very long time. I first visited China in 1971, and even before that, I was interviewing refugees in Hong Kong. And, uh, you know, at the time, what we're studying was the role of Mao Zedong, uh, the extreme politicization of everyday life. And therefore, I uh, observed with great hope all the reforms that were introduced after Mao passed from the scene, the reforms introduced by Deng Xiaoping beginning in the late 70s. Now, it's true that the reforms of the economy, the economic system, were more radical than the reforms of the political system, but the political reforms were significant, too. Uh, less, less than four years after Mao's death, Deng Xiaoping wrote a very important essay uh, about the need for China to move away from what he called over-concentration of power in the hands of an individual leader to establish a more institutionalized system of government under collective leadership of the Communist Party. And it's uh, this essay on the reform of the leadership system of party and government is really a remarkable essay published in 1980. And he blamed China's problems, uh, not so much on Mao as an individual, but on the system of government, which he called over-concentration of power. And he said that this over-concentration of power gives rise to, quote, arbitrary rule by individuals at the expense of collective leadership. Uh, Mao's unchecked dictatorial power allowed him to launch campaigns like the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution that uh, created tragically high costs for Chinese society, the Chinese people. Now, how could it happen that one man could take China in such a um, a direction essentially kind of almost took China off a cliff in the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution. Now, some leaders certainly uh, felt that they had almost a religious faith in Mao's judgment and thought, well, he must know what's best for China because he had been the, he had achieved such great things. But I think it's probably likely that many leaders were just plain intimidated by Mao and afraid to question his judgment. They went along with him to protect themselves, their own careers, and also they didn't trust one another enough to coordinate efforts to try to hold him back. The temptation to uh, win Mao's favor by betraying one another was just too great, as we saw in the Gao Gong affair in the 1950s. So there were really no checks on the leader. Uh, and he, under uh, Mao Zedong, it was possible for one man to take China really to the brink of disaster and, and um, collapse. So, you know, this is the risk of personalistic dictatorship, that unchecked power means that one individual can decide to do something and really endanger the rule of the Communist Party and the, rule, and the, the country itself. So now, today, we see China moving back to highly concentrated personalistic leadership after decades of collective leadership. 
And this surprises me because generally we think in communist authoritarian regimes with more modernized societies and economies, their governance system becomes more institutionalized and one man leadership is not common. Uh, we have a growing middle class in China. We have a very modern open market economy. Um, and, and yet, we, and I'm not suggesting that Xi Jinping is governing exactly like Mao, but I'm saying that he is centralizing and concentrating power once again more than any of the leaders since, since Mao. So when we try to figure out how this could happen, we, the first thing that journalists and all of us China watchers do is we turn to Xi the man, the personality. And we focus on him as an individual, the fact that he's the princeling son of a revolutionary uh, leader. This gives him a strong sense of identification with the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, people who know him say that he has a strong sense of mission to try to save the party from the fate uh, that the Soviet Party experienced. And that, uh, you know, he has a whole analysis of what caused the fall of the Communist Party in the Soviet Union, which has a lot to do with the lack of commitment among party members and the military. And he says no one was man enough to stand up and defend the party. So for him, it looks like the key is the loyalty of party members and military uh, to party rule. And, you know, reportedly, in his thinking as a princeling, Jiang Zemin, Hu Jintao, they were sort of mediocre imposters uh, who were just kind of minding the store until Xi Jinping and other princelings uh, of his generation were of the right age to step up and inherit the mantle of power from their fathers who were the revolutionary founders. Now, of course, the personal attributes of leaders matter. Um, different leaders may utilize the same institutions differently. Some leaders have bigger ambitions than others. Uh, Hu Jintao, Xi Jinping's predecessor, looked like he was actually quite a self-effacing leader who didn't really have the appetite for power the way some other Chinese leaders did. So it's fascinating to try to figure out Xi Jinping as an individual. But just as Deng Xiaoping sought to analyze the problem more institutionally than blaming Mao as an individual, I've been turning to the institutions of governance to reframe the question, which is why the way I'm framing the question uh, in my talk today is why did the political institutionalization that Deng Xiaoping introduced after Mao's death, rules and practices designed to check arbitrary dictatorial rule, why did they fail to prevent the emergence of another dictator? And I'm using dictator quite loosely here, so don't, um, you know, what I mean is one man leadership, concentrated leadership. You know, it actually looks like it was surprisingly easy for Xi Jinping to do this, which is a, you know, a puzzle for me. So that's why I'm focusing on the institutional context. As Deng Xiaoping said in that 1980 essay, um, he said, a sound system can prevent would-be evildoers from running amok. Under a bad system, 
even good people will be unable to do things well and may in fact move in the opposite direction. So uh, the institutional uh, uh, context really matters a lot. And the fact that I'm going back to uh, analyze the institutions, this is a little bit of a personal self, intellectual self-criticism on my part. <laughs> because I wrote this book called The Political Logic of Economic Reform in China, in which I laid out a kind of loose descriptive model of how Chinese politics works that focused a lot on the collective institutions of the Communist Party, especially the Central Committee, um, and talked about the Central Committee as the selectorate. And there are a number of concepts in that book that, you know, I, I'd say if you look at China scholars, there are some people who did sort of China watching in a very traditional way, focused on personalities and factions and that kind of thing. Continuously, they basically kept doing it the same as under Mao. But I felt that Chinese politics had really changed in the post-Mao era and that these institutions really mattered and that we needed to understand uh, the authority relations set up by these institutions. So the fact, what I'm doing now is sort of turning back to that and saying, well, why did they turn out to be less constraining than I thought they were going to be? So let's, uh, what I'm going to do is briefly just sketch how China is being governed under Xi Jinping. But much of this is very familiar to everyone. So I'm going to try to do this pretty quickly. Then I'll turn to the political institutionalization that occurred over the 35 years uh, to consider why it was inadequate to uh, prevent the emergence of a personalistic uh, dictatorship. OK, so China under Xi Jinping today. Xi has surprised people by consolidating his personal authority to an extent that we haven't seen since Mao Zedong. The Australian China scholar Jeremy Barmy uh, calls Xi Jinping the COE of China, the chairman of everything. Uh, he is ruling through leading small groups that allow him to bypass the collective institutions of the Communist Party and the State Council, the government, bureaucracy. Uh, there are 18 central leading small groups. Seven, at least seven, are led by Xi, Xi Jinping himself. And those are the most important ones, including the ones on reform, military reform, cyberspace, economics and finance, foreign affairs, national security, commission in Taiwan. By ruling through these leading small groups, which are part of the Communist Party, under the party. Um, there are interagency groups. Some of them are very large. Um, but they all have one or two key staff running the offices. And these are people chosen by Xi, usually people he's known for some time. Uh, people like Li Jianshu, the chief of staff, his chief of staff, who's also director of the National Security Commission, uh, Lioha. These are the ones that he really is working closely with and the ones he trusts. Uh, reportedly, and this might not be a bad principle for any politician, he doesn't trust anyone he came to know after he became the anointed successor, because he figures those are opportunists and people just playing up to him. He only trusts the ones he knew before that, his old associates. So it's basically Xi Jinping with the heads and vice heads of these leading small groups is his method of governing. Second important point, the party 
is taking charge of everything, even of the economy. So it has withdrawn the power that had been delegated to the government to manage the economy. And that was the pattern that Deng Xiaoping introduced. Uh, you even had some of this under Mao uh, of delegating to the state council ministries and departments the authority uh, of running the economy. So now the government is more implementing decisions made on the party side. Xi Jinping, of course, the general secretary, always has the direct command over the military. That's not new. But he also has direct command over the internal security apparatus. It's no longer another senior leader in the standing committee in charge of internal security. Xi Jinping is his own internal security czar. Third, or maybe even now this is fourth, uh, anti-corruption campaign, which is he, his very close associate on the standing committee, Wang Qishan, is the head of the Central Discipline Commission, and they are using the anti-corruption campaign to restore popular respect for the Communist Party and to you know, really clean up corruption as best they can but also to eliminate rivals who might challenge Xi Jinping's power, basically to decapitate any rival factions. Now, whenever you redistribute the spoils of power like that, you know, you're potentially asking for trouble. Other elites may push back, and one of the interesting questions we might want to discuss is whether or not we think there will be some serious resistance um, to Xi Jinping uh, at the elite level. Uh, but who would be willing to take the risk? You know, uh, on the one hand, people are probably less afraid of Xi Jinping than they are than they were of Mao. Uh, and. Xi Jinping, uh, however, is extremely popular with the ordinary citizens in China, at least up until now, although a economic problems could undercut that kind of mass popularity. Uh, so the question of organizing an elite challenge is an interesting one. Uh, also, within the Chinese Communist Party, Xi Jinping has introduced a lot of top-down disciplinary rules that forbid members, including senior cadre in the party, from taking positions different from the party line or asking questions about politically incorrect issues related to party history, anything like that. And um, I hear from a number of people that local officials in China are quite resentful of these, uh, these, these new disciplinary rules that they can't express any views of their own. What's happening is that in democratic centralism, we're getting a heavy emphasis on centralism rather than democracy. Uh, there's also an effort to demobilize society, tighten controls over society by controls over media and internet, education, civil society, arrests of lawyers, taking censorship to new extremes, thickening and uh, making taller the Great Firewall, people getting harassed just for using VPN sometimes. Um, and uh, control of information is a very, very important part of Xi Jinping's governing formula. Much like Putin, and here I see a lot of similarity, they control information in order to make themselves look more competent in the eyes of the people. Um, a re-emphasis of ideology, and that means for appointments and promotions, 
This is something that I studied my very first book, Competitive Comrades, talks about virtuocracy, a system in which definition of political virtue was one of the criteria for promotion and university admission. Uh, and I talked about the impact on society of uh, this type of system. I thought it was history, but it appears that there are elements of virtuocracy that are returning again. And then, of course, a very heavy quotient of anti-foreign nationalism mobilized around especially the maritime claims as the focal point. So this highly centralized system dominated by Xi and a small circle of loyal aides and advisors, increases the risks of sudden shifts in policy, for good or for bad. Um, and we do see some signs of erratic policy-making process. Now, of course, we don't know to what extent Xi Jinping himself has been responsible for decisions, for example, related to the stock market. Um, you know, especially in the financial sector, we have no idea. Maybe this was all Li Keqiang and others, maybe she, but it's hard to know. But what we definitely see is a lot of lurching from one side to another, and the policy surprises. Um, uh, in the decision making, including not just stock market, but the uh, ADIZ in the East China Sea suddenly comes out drilling the drilling rig near Vietnam. So a kind of erratic, sudden uh, policy decisions. And some of them are positive ones, like uh, in uh, during the summit, Xi Jinping declares no militarization of the islands. Well, that was news to the PLA, but uh, he made that decision to uh, have a good summit. Other things, including uh, agreeing to stop the cyber hacking of commercial secrets, that sort of came out of nowhere, too, on the eve of the summit after people had been saying for months and months, impossible, never happened, then it happens. So, um, you know, it suggests that this overly, this uh, highly centralized system is leading to that pattern of, of decision making. Now, it also is a kind of decision making that doesn't seem to be working very well for market reform. This kind of top down, uh, strongman leadership is not the way you build a market economy. Now, I think a lot of people, maybe in China too, um, as well as abroad, have uh, memories of the success of the early phases of reform under Deng Xiaoping, and they think it's because Deng was such a strong leader. But actually, that's not the reason why it was so successful, because it was all about decentralization. It was all about providing incentives for key interest groups, key constituencies, to want to support the market reform. It was not a top-down kind of design. OK, so that's the Xi uh, system. Now let me shift to this 35 years of institutionalization. And l let me just quickly describe what are the key elements of institutionalization. Deng Xiaoping never envisioned full electoral democracy. It was not really about democracy, per se. He wanted to regularize and institutionalize the Chinese Communist Party to improve the way it governs China, to restrict arbitrary personal power, and define precisely the authority of institutions. 
we had new party and state constitutions in 1982, and you can see these institutions laid out there. First, fixed terms of office and retirement age, not tenure for life. Now, on the party side, this is not written down. This is not written. This is established by precedent. So one of the interesting questions is, will it be modified uh, at the 18th Party Congress, or might even Xi Jinping even decide to stay on for more than the uh, normal two terms? Uh, another key element of institutionalization was to solve the problem of succession. Succession is the Achilles heel of communist authoritarian governments. Very difficult to have a peaceful transfer of power. But, you know, I give China a lot of credit for achieving this. First, when Jiang Zemin stepped down from almost all his positions in 2002, and then Hu Jintao from all his positions in 2012. So that's a key feature of institutionalization. Uh, another important dimension was this delegation of authority over most policy making, especially economic policy making, from the party to the government where the officials have more expertise, they're more competent to manage the economy. Uh, Deng Xiaoping said in that essay, we should distinguish between the responsibilities of the party and those of the government and stop substituting the former for the latter. So in 1987, they even <laughs> revised the constitution to make clear that the party and the government should be separated, uh, including eliminating these party groups within government ministries. Uh, also, select officials who are younger, better educated, and better qualified, and promote them according to standardized criteria. And then, strengthen the collective institutions of the Communist Party, especially the Central Committee, which means having it meet regularly and deliberate democratically. According to the party constitution during, from the 80s on, the Central Committee, a body of several hundred officials, has the authority to choose the top leaders. Um, they are what I call the selectorate, and this term is now used quite a lot in political science. Uh, there's even been a lot of talk uh, in the Hu Jintao era about intra-party democracy, to have the Central Committee really deliberate and make selection of leaders in a democratic way. They never really had campaigning to the Central Committee the way you have in Vietnam or you had during certain periods in the Soviet Union, but they did have these straw polls, these kind of popularity contests to make sure that the Central Committee didn't say no to the nominees for the top leaders. Um, and, uh, and then each Another uh, feature of institutionalization is each Politburo member and Politburo Standing Committee member has authority over a particular sector. So it's a kind of power sharing arrangement among the top elite, and of course that means sharing of patronage, sharing of the rents as well, and decisions made by consensus uh, in the top party elite. There was also giving legislatures, the People's Congress, a little more authority to make laws. So these are the important steps in the, in the direction of a more institutionalized communist system that were carried out in the 1980s. Now, when during the Tiananmen crisis, or after the Tiananmen crisis in 1989, 
um, when the leadership split over how to react to these widespread demonstrations, and the system really came to the brink of collapse, uh, Deng Xiaoping ordered the military in to forcibly put down the demonstrations and save CCP rule. And of course, at the time, some very influential leaders in the party, they blamed these reforms of institutionalization uh, for causing the crisis that had led to Tiananmen. Um, but, and some of them were reversed, like this one about eliminating the party groups within state council ministries, that was reversed. But by and large, most of the measures of institutionalization <coughs> continued. They were, not, they were not reversed. So uh, Jiang Zemin, Hu Jintao, they ruled as first among equals. You had collective leadership. You had some pretty clear rules about retirement, age limits. Central Committee met regularly. Um, and you had these leaders step down peacefully. So, you know, it looked uh, like a, quite a different system than the Mao system. And when uh, Xi Jinping was chosen to be successor, all expectations were that he was going to rule much the same, that nobody expected him to be a strong man leader. He was not that outstanding. He was okay, he was a princeling, but there was no evidence earlier that he would um, rule the way he is ruling today. So what we see is, is that these steps in the direction of institutionalization were not adequate to uh, prevent to check Xi Jinping from uh, centralizing power. Uh, I was reading Fred Tevis, a wonderful scholar of elite politics who did a lot of great work in, oh gosh, the 1980s, 1990s, continues. And he wrote then that the rules still suffer from ambiguities and remain vulnerable to political circumstances and personalities. The ultimate question of power is not genuinely regulated by formal procedures. And that is, I think, what we must conclude about the institutionalization that was introduced over the past 35 years. What, and as I look at this, it is, um, uh, you know, I'm also going back to look at uh, the Soviet Union and even the earliest days in the Soviet Communist Party in the 30s and the way the template of Communist Party institutions was then transferred to China as well as Vietnam, North Korea, and other communist countries. And what I think we find is that authority within Communist Party institutions of these collective institutions is not clearly defined. And that they are prone to the centralization of power in the hands of a dictator. Um, in Deng's essay, which I have cited several times. He even says this. He says that the tradition of a high degree of concentration of power in the hands of individual leaders of communist countries, in uh, communist parties in various countries. So Deng himself also sees that this is a pattern not unique to Mao's China, but one which has been a problem in other communist regimes as well. So when we look at, say, the Central Committee, the collective institution that really should be the main locus because it has the formal authority 
to choose the leaders. But yet it doesn't meet continuously. Its deliberative processes are unwieldy. And that there's always a tendency to centralize decision making in a small executive group at the top. And this brings us back to a concept that I proposed uh, in my political logic book, which I'm sort of intrigued to be turning back to now. Reciprocal accountability. The notion of reciprocal accountability is the accountability from the top leadership and the central committee selectorate. It's reciprocal because the central committee consists of party, government, and military officials who have been um, appointed to their jobs by the top leadership. And yet, they have the authority to choose the top leadership. So the lines of accountability go both ways. It's a lot like the Pope and the College of Cardinals. <laughs> In fact, that's why I love to follow Pope Francis, the reformer, and how he's doing. Because it's a lot like the Chinese Communist Party. The Pope appoints the cardinals, but the cardinals choose the Pope. So this is reciprocal accountability. But whereas in my political logic book, I saw during the 80s, that the fact that the top leadership was accountable to the Central Committee caused them to develop reform policies that would be popular with some of the key blocks in the Central Committee. I saw that kind of uh, accountability of the leaders to the Central Committee as having a lot of influence on the policy outcomes. But I think it's fair to say now, and here's my self-criticism, that, re, that reciprocal accountability is just a very ambi ambiguous authority relationship, you know, principal-agent relationship, very ambiguous. And this central committee has no independent authority, really. It's not accountable to the public, so it doesn't have that basis for its authority. And it's dependent on the leaders for their jobs. So it's just too risky, dangerous for them to really speak up and try to constrain the leadership. Second, the institutionalization that Deng Xiaoping introduced really never created real legislatures. Now, in other authoritarian regimes, legislatures do play a much more important role and sometimes are directly elected. The Vietnamese legislature is directly elected. The National People's Congress is indirectly elected. Now, the National People's Congress has constitutional authority to select top leaders in the government. But so does the party top leaders. And the reality is that the National People's Congress really doesn't have the authority to choose the leaders. So once again, we have these very ambiguous authority relations which are not, means that these institutions are not able to check autocratic power um, as they uh, might otherwise. The party delegated a lot of authority to the government during the reform era to uh, make decisions about the economy and other um, subjects. But this was a delegation relationship. In other words, the party is the principal, the government was the agent. And in that kind of relationship, the principal can always bring that power back to the party. And that's what we see happening in China today, the party reclaiming leadership. Um, so there are other features of Communist Party rule in China during this period that 
I also see as significant for uh, making it very difficult to constrain the top leaders, such as secrecy, the whole fetish for secrecy, which of course makes it so hard for scholars like me to actually know for sure how things work, but also it's a, um, because Chinese Communist Party rule or any Leninist Party rule is prone to leadership splits and has no institutionalized mechanism for resolving them, secrecy is required for party rule to survive. There are a lot of other dimensions that I don't have time to talk about now. So um, let me just finish up and so we can have a good discussion. So my conclusion is that you know, I think Deng Xiaoping would be really unhappy <laughs> uh, with the current situation because he hoped that the, in, uh, the steps toward institutionalization that he put in play in 1980 would uh, prevent the rise of another personalistic dictator. Uh, but, you know, I, I sort of talk to Dung at night and say, you know, you didn't go far enough. <laughs> you didn't really give that, the People's Congress, any real solid independent authority. You didn't uh, find a way for the Central Committee Selectorate to really have clear, um, enough authority to constrain the leadership. I mean, the size of these bodies isn't even fixed, okay? So it's all endogenous. You know, they can monkey around with the size of the Central Committee, the Politburo, the Standing Committee, in order to uh, solve uh, the problems of political competition they have. It's not fixed. So the ambiguity of Communist Party institutions is responsible for the difficulty that China is having in uh, preventing Xi Jinping from concentrating power today. Now, uh, Tevis predicted that the institutionalization, institutionalized patterns would take over fully only after the revolutionary generation passed away. He thought generations would lead to, you know, future generations would have a more institutionalized system. So one interesting question is whether or not this generation of princelings who also derive their authority and legitimacy, such as it is, from the fact that they are the offspring of the revolutionary founders. Is this, will this continue into the future? Is this a systemic problem or will we see future generations of Chinese leaders try to find ways to restore or to create checks and balances on over-concentration of power once again. So uh, I'm really hoping for a good discussion. I'm sure many of you have uh, uh, questions and ideas and uh, we can talk for a little more time, right? So thank you very much.